Mario wasn't always the super adventuring plumber that we know and love today. Let's take a look at his storied past and recap his origins before talking about our next game, Wrecking Crew. According to numerous news outlets and polling websites, Mario is one of the most well-known fictional characters of all time, surpassing even the likes of Mickey Mouse, say the results of this poll conducted outside of Japan in the 1990s. However, before he became the icon of Nintendo and a main character in their best-selling franchise, he was relegated to a myriad of odd jobs, serving as Nintendo's plug-and-play character suited to every genre, giving animators a simple sprite to remaster in between titles, and consumers a recognizable face. Mario's, or rather Jumpman's as he was known in Japan, debut came with 1981's Donkey Kong. Notably, Nintendo did intend to use Popeye for this position, as they had utilized him in video games previously. But due to licensing disagreements, Miyamoto ultimately came up with a new design for an original character. In his first game ever, Mario sported his most iconic blue-collar look as a brave carpenter, showcasing a red hat, blue overalls, and his famous Italian mustache. He was the game's protagonist, saving his damsel in distress, Pauline, from the clutches of an evil gorilla. In the next entry in the series, Donkey Kong Jr., he would reappear, instead as a villain, caging up the ape to prevent him from meeting with his son. A couple of years later, he would appear alongside the debut of Luigi, his brother and a recolored version of Mario's same design, in Mario Bros. for Arcade. This was his first iteration as a plumber, showing off his familiarity with pipes in the underground, later staples of the Super Mario Bros. franchise. Mario would then appear in an assortment of Game & Watch games, the handheld Nintendo introduced in the early 80s, acting as anything from a zookeeper to a fireman. In the black box set, we've already gone over a couple of positions we've seen Mario in. He was the main character from Golf, still sporting his mustache and dad bod, and the referee in Tennis. He also made an appearance in Pinball in the bonus stage, helping the player rack up points while saving Pauline. Essentially, wherever Nintendo needed Mario, they put him. His role in their games was ambiguous and wouldn't be fully sorted out until Super Mario Bros. While Mario did still make cameos in various Nintendo games, he would be given a true identity as Nintendo's mascot, due to the commercial success and critical acclaim from Super Mario Bros. However, before he made it there, there was one more job Mario had to complete, working for Spike the Foreman in Wrecking Crew. Mario wasn't actually slotted to be used in this title. It was Miyamoto who recommended to Yoshio Sakamoto, Wrecking Crew's designer, that they use him, as Mario is really easy to draw and people recognize him. And so it stuck. Just about every game we've talked about so far has had multiple game modes to experiment with. However, other than the design mode in Wrecking Crew, it only had one single player experience. This doesn't mean it's lacking in content though, far from it. Wrecking Crew features a hundred different stages, each with their own puzzles to solve in this vertically based puzzle platformer. The basic premise, like many other black box titles, wasn't particularly complicated. The player had to smash all destroyable blocks in a section of scaffolding, utilizing Mario's hammer carefully planning their way up and down the environment. This planning was the key to success. If a player accidentally destroyed a ladder leading to a higher section, for example, they could end up making a level completely impossible to finish, necessitating a restart. To hinder Mario's progress, three different enemy types appeared, sometimes multiple on a single stage. Gotcha wrenches, which would chase Mario directly at different speeds depending on their color, Eggplants, which would sprint around randomly, and Foreman Spike, a character that couldn't directly kill Mario, but would attempt to make his life as difficult as possible by hitting him down to the ground floor with his own hammer. Spike was particularly dangerous, as in certain levels that required Mario to stay up on higher floors to start, Spike's hammer would send him tumbling down to the floor meaning a reset or suicide would be the only way out. Additionally, fireballs would occasionally appear on either side of the screen on the level that Mario occupied. These functioned in the same manner as they did in the Mario Bros. arcade game. They forced the player to move around, never feeling comfortable where they were and making them quickly think of ways to escape from tight situations, as to ensure that they wouldn't get quartered by any enemies. Dissimilar to other appearances of Mario, he was actually unable to jump in this game, something reminiscent of Professor Hector from Gyromite, which would be released a few months after Wrecking Crew in Japan. When taking a look at the game's credits, this makes quite a bit of sense. The two games were both developed by Nintendo's Research and Development 1, produced by Gunpei Yokoi, directed by Satoru Okada, and had soundtracks composed by Hirokazu Tanaka. 
These two titles would also be the only puzzle platformers present in the entire Black Box set. While these developers did come together to work on later Nintendo games, they would shift their focus to action platformers, along the likes of Super Mario Land for the Game Boy. Wrecking Crew did a fantastic job of milking every last drop of gameplay that could be found with its simple mechanics. While it did get overshadowed by other games that launched right beside it in the 1985 release, most notably Super Mario Bros., it holds up very well for its age and is still fun to this day. It also saw a direct sequel in the form of Wrecking Crew 98, initially releasing for the Super Famicom's Nintendo Power Download service and later as a physical cartridge. While, unlike Excite Bike 64 to Excite Bike, it felt like more of a reinterpretation of the original title. As it transitioned to a Tetris game akin to Puyo Puyo, it is still one of the few black box games to receive the honors of a follow-up entry. Once again, Nintendo gives a nod to its roots in the Super Smash Bros. franchise, where the theme of the game plays upon picking up a golden hammer item. Shortly after Wrecking Crew's release, a small influx in puzzle platformers began making their way into the NES, starting with Solomon's Key in 1986 and continuing onwards with titles such as Snow Bros in 1991 and Fire and Ice in 92. While these games didn't necessarily follow the exact direction of Wrecking Crew, it is likely that programmers took note of the way in which the game optimized its mechanics to create complex, single-screen levels that still felt innovative. As mentioned previously, the team that worked on Mario's last part-time job ended up working together on several more projects, including Super Mario Land and Metroid, a game that single-handedly revolutionized platformers. Metroid was produced by Yokoi, directed by Okada, assisted by Makoto Kano, who helped to design Wrecking Crew, and featured music by Tanaka. There are also many similarities between the titles. While Wrecking Crew focuses on a single screen, probably because of the hardware limitations present at the time, it does require the player to think ahead before making any actions, lest they have to backtrack to destroy a different block. Metroid also has heavy emphasis on planning, but due to advancements in technology, implements multi-screen action and encourages backtracking. Both games contain few complex mechanics, but utilize them extraordinarily effectively. While Wrecking Crew may have been overshadowed at the time of its release, it is important to acknowledge the stepping stone the game served as for Mario, the developers, and the future of puzzle platformers on the NES. It may not be the most memorable game, but it's a surprisingly deep title with quite a bit of value, even by today's standards. And with Spike's upcoming appearance as Mario and Luigi's boss in the new Mario movie, we may see a few more people trying it out. Maybe it'll get more of the recognition that it deserves.